Hi, and welcome to the presentation on goal setting, behavior modification, and maintaining motivation, brought to you by allceus.com. Over the next hour, you're going to learn about how to elicit goals from your clients and convert them into observable, measurable goal statements. We'll talk about the goal hierarchy, going from the large goal to the sub-goal or the objective, and skills. We'll talk about how to use the five W's to create a functional action plan, the basic principles of behavior modification and how to apply them to help clients achieve their goals, how to help clients achieve goals through successive approximations, the three dimensions of motivation and how to use all three to support your clients, how to identify and overcome barriers to goal achievement, the different types of learning styles and how most effectively to teach both individual and mixed groups how to learn, how to achieve different goals, how temperament impacts learning and motivation, how to modify your approach to accommodate learning styles and temperaments, and ways to modify the environment to increase energy and motivation. That's a lot of stuff, so let's get started. So there are some common questions that we all hear. How can I be happier? What can I do to be healthier? How can I improve my relationships? Think for a second about other questions that you commonly hear in your practice. Depending on whether you work with children or you work with adults or families, etc., you may hear different types of questions. But I want you to get in your mind some of these common kind of vague general questions that you get from clients and stakeholders that you need to respond to. Once you hear these vague, how can I be healthier? You say, OK, well, I kind of know what direction you want to go in. Obviously, it's not wanting to go over here and change your career or work on your relationships necessarily right now. You want to be healthier. So we have a general idea of where we're going. Now we have to break this down into smaller goals because Rome wasn't built in a day. And most likely, your clients have a need for rel relatively frequent reinforcement. Why? Because change is hard. Change is hard. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. Think about the last time you made a New Year's resolution. Was it really fun after about a week? The first week, it was a challenge. It was fun. After about a week, no, the gym just didn't sound so good. Or eating broccoli every night didn't sound like exactly what you wanted to do. So we need to set small sub-goals to help people achieve their larger goal. It's not going to happen overnight, and we also don't want them to get frustrated. So once we have these smaller goals, then we need to figure out the skills and knowledge that they need. Before you can do anything, and, and graduate school is a prime example. When we go to graduate school, we learn a lot. We learn a lot of textbook knowledge. That's just it. It's knowledge. It's not skills. It's not abilities. It's words on a page, general theory, foundations. Then the person has to be able to take that information and translate it into real life stuff. So we can talk about how to be healthier. I can give you a whole class on nutrition. We can talk about all the different things that you can do in the gym. But until you take it and make it into something practical for that particular individual, you're not going to get anywhere. So your overarching reasons that you begin to do something are your goals. They're usually broad and abstract. Most people don't say, hmm, let's see, I want to improve my fitness by 10%. They say, I want to get healthier. They don't say, I want to stop using alcohol 40% of the time. They say, I need to quit drinking so much. So the first thing that we need to do is help them define exactly what they mean. What is it going to look like? And then we need to break it down into measurable objectives. You're probably not going to take somebody who's been smoking three packs a day and turn them into a non-smoker in two days. So you need to learn about the effects of nicotine, the effects of nicotine withdrawal, the different options that are out there to help people through nicotine withdrawal, 
and also some of the psychological and habitual or behavioral things that will need to be addressed in order to um, actually successfully quit smoking. It's not just the drug. It's a habit. It's a reaction. So these are all things we need to increase people's knowledge about. That's a manageable objective. You can learn X, Y, Z. And we want to phrase goals as adding positives instead of removing negatives. Yes, you want to quit smoking. OK, great. So why do you smoke? To relax, out of habit, when you're bored, to have something to do with your hands? There's a lot of reasons people may smoke. So what we need to say is, what are the reasons? And let's add some different things. Because once we take away the cigarettes, those hands are going to be going, uh, got to do something. A lot of people learn to crochet, <laughs> do crossword puzzles, play video games, anything to keep their hands busy. So you need to ask the person, what is it that you want to do instead? You just can't take away a behavior, otherwise the person is sitting there in Never Never Land. So take the broad goal, identify sub-goals. How will you know you're making progress? And figure out ways you can phrase it in a positive instead of you'll stop smoking, but you will start doing X, Y, and Z instead of smoking. You're adding a behavior instead of taking it away. Semantics, I know. One way to elicit goals is through the miracle question. If you woke up tomorrow and you were clean and sober, or you were a non-smoker, what would be different? This may give you insight into this particular person and how the behavior affects them positively and negatively, what they use it for, and all the reasons they may want to change, which will help you better define the problem. Objectives need to be in measurable terms. What does it mean to cut down on your smoking? What does it mean to be happier? What does it mean to be healthier? How will the person know when they've made any progress? If something is easily measurable in terms of maybe the number of times they go to the gym, the number of cigarettes they smoke, how many drinks they have, how many times they scream at their spouse, you know, there are a lot of things that are measurable. But some things like being happier, it's more difficult. So you may give them a Likert scale. Most of us learned about those in graduate school. On a scale of 1 to 5, 1 being miserably depressed, 5 being over the moon happy, 3 being kind of average, more days than not, Sally wants to feel like she's a 3, 4, or 5 on her happiness scale. That's kind of bulky as far as wording. You can work with it. But the point being, you're asking her to rate something, and you're asking her to use the same definition each day. Now, Sally's three may be different than Susie's three or John's three, but that's a whole different story. When you're working with goals, you need to work with the individual so they can define it for themselves. A lot of times, you can measure more abstract concepts with frequency. Look at some behaviors that you might do if you were happier. Not crying as much, exercising more, having more energy, uh, calling your friends. Give me some examples of what you might be doing differently if you were happier. Then we'll measure the frequency of that. Intensity. And that's kind of where we're at with the Likert scale. On a scale of 1, miserable, to 5, elated, What's the intensity? What's the level of your happiness? Talk with your clients. Have them identify what's going to be meaningful to measure. So one activity that you can do to practice this is write down these following common goals on a piece of paper. A lot of people want to lose weight, get in shape, feel better about myself, or be happier. For each of those goals, 
identify two ways the person might know that they're achieving their goal. Lose weight. Their pants may fit a little bit better. Or they actually may go down to X number of pounds. Get in shape. Maybe they'll be able to run a mile in 12 minutes instead of walking it in 20. Identify goals. Start with the phrase, how will you know when you have achieved or when you are feeling fill in the blank? Once you have the big idea going on, then we break it down into smaller objectives. You're not going to go from walking a 20-minute mile to running a 12-minute mile in two weeks. I hope. You're probably pushing yourself too hard if you are. So we want to break these down into objectives. What do you need to do to get from point A to point B? Well, a good start would be working out at least three days a week. In substance abuse recovery, getting from point A to point B. Point A being you're clean, but you're not living the life of sobriety. And point B is you're clean and sober. So what are the first things that you need to do? Maybe start going to three meetings a week or 90 and 90. Identify objectives that can be accomplished, measured, and rewarded each week. These will all combine to make your ultimate goal a reality. You need to learn about addiction if you're trying to get clean and sober. You need to learn different ways to deal with stress and deal with life on life's terms. Each person is going to have their own set of objectives, their own agenda, if you will. That is why individualized treatment plans are so vital. Sam may have gone through treatment three times already. He may already have that foundation knowledge about what addiction is, but he hasn't yet gotten honest with himself about why he engages in those behaviors. Sally, this may be her first time through, and she has no clue as to what's going on. She doesn't know about protracted withdrawal. She doesn't know about the pink cloud. She doesn't know about any of that. So we need to educate her. Give her a strong foundation of knowledge that she can build off of. If, as I do, you believe that people do the best they can with the tools they have at any given time, let me say that again. This is one of my favorite phrases. People do the best they can with the tools they have at any given time. Then you understand that your client now needs to learn how to change. They don't have the tools. They don't have some of the knowledge. You can give me a, a, a toolbox full of all kinds of really cool, sharp um, tools that I can use. That would be a mistake, <laughs> a big mistake, ask my husband, because I don't know how to use them. So I can go willy-nilly plugging in this saw and doing that, and I'm probably going to end up losing a finger. People may have tools. They also have to have the knowledge to help them understand how to use them in an appropriate way. One of the things in solution-focused approaches is that we identify the fact that there are times, we call these exceptions, when people have not been engaging in the behavior. Drinking, anger outbursts, depression, eating, uh, whatever the goal may be. These are called exceptions. So give me a, an example of a time in your past when you didn't feel the urge to drink. What was different? This helps the person identify exceptions that they can start highlighting. They can do those things more often. Tell me about a time in your past when you wanted to drink, but you chose not to. How did you make that happen? What was different? Those are the tools the person has. Now, right now, at their current place, those tools have been overwhelmed. It's like trying to use a handsaw to take down a big old tree. Not going to work. At least not very well. So 
what you've got to do is say, okay, this is where we start. You know you need a saw. We need a bigger, stronger saw in order to take that tree down. It's our goal to help them figure out how to strengthen the tools or how to more effectively use the tools that they have. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. We've all heard that. The same is true for therapy. It's not my job to fix them. It's my job to give them the tools so they can fix themselves. Because everybody is going to continue to encounter issues. That's life. Dealing with life on life's terms. So one of the things we need to do is help people learn what their skills are, how to use them, and how to figure out what they need. Once you've identified your goals and your objectives, then we go into the five W's. Who is responsible for doing what, when, where, why, and then the how. So, what are you responsible for as the clinician? Providing the book for them to read? Maybe. It's up to them to read it. When do they need to have it read by? What are they responsible for doing when and where? Are they supposed to read it in group? Is this something they're supposed to do in session? Is this something they're supposed to do between sessions? What is their end date? What is their deadline for getting this accomplished? We all do better with deadlines. Life happens. You know, somebody may be doing great in the program and then their wife has a baby. Oops, going to lose a week there. Um, or more, depending on whether the baby has colic. But I digress. All dates are guidelines. They're modifiable. Something may happen in someone's life. There may be a death in the family. So they're not going to be real interested in working on self-esteem issues when grief is predominating. So your dates are guidelines for when things should be done. That keeps everybody moving forward. If you have to readjust, then do so. Remind them that this is their plan at their pace designed to help them meet their goals. Once you can't say that, then it's your treatment plan and it's not going to help your client. Client responsibilities. Some of the things you might put in. Prompt attendance. Don't show up 15 minutes late. Prepare for sessions. Uh, don't come in with a hangover. <laughs> That's usually bad in substance abuse or any other kind of treatment. But make sure that they are ready, willing, and able to participate. Discussing with you what is and is not working for them, including the environment and the time. Not everybody's comfortable in group. Some people are not comfortable in certain places. Maybe the time doesn't work for your particular client. The group that you have meets in the evening from 6 to 9 o'clock, and they have to be up at 3 a.m. to go to work. OK, so let's talk about what we can do differently. What can we do to help you meet your goals and get to treatment? Some exercises and interventions may be perfectly valid, and you may absolutely love them. But if your client's not willing to do it, it's not going to work. I say this in a lot of my other videos, and I'll say it today. I don't journal. I didn't keep a diary when I was 14, 15, 16. Now that I'm significantly older than that, I still won't do it. I just can't bring myself to do it. I'm a list person. I will talk about it. My dog gets an earful every single day. But I'm not the kind of person who is going to write in a diary. I just don't even know where to start. So ask your clients what works for them. Some of my clients that have had similar temperaments to mine, I've suggested talking into a uh, tape player. Well, that shows how old I am. But um, <laughs> recording their voice so they can replay it and listen to it, so they can reflect upon it, at least so they get it out. And then maybe later we can use that for information. Is it their responsibility 
to do out-of-session assignments. Yes. It's also our responsibility, and we'll get to this in a minute, to check those assignments. Hey, it's our responsibility to show up on time. Go figure. I cannot stand it when I go to a doctor's office, a dentist's office, any kind of office, and they're running 30, 40 minutes late. Five or 10 minutes I get. Don't like it, but I get it. But when you start running, what my children's old dentist always ran between an hour and a half and three hours behind. And you couldn't call and get information ahead of time and plan. They wanted you there at your appointment time, even if they were running three hours behind. That doesn't work for me. And it doesn't work for your client, because guess what? That tells the client, you don't matter to me. My time is more important than yours. So we need to show up on time and be prepared. Don't walk into a session and start fumbling through the chart going, OK, let me see. Why are you here today? No, not working. Even doctors at least stop outside. You can hear them outside the door fumbling with the chart to try to figure out who you are and why you're there. But at least they do it before they walk in the room. Be prepared for your sessions. Educate clients about the fundamentals of what they're doing and why. Why am I asking you to go to 12-step meetings? Why am I asking you to do your autobiography? Why am I asking you to fill in the blank? Whatever it is. One of my pet peeves when I used to work in community behavioral health was when clients would ask my staff something, and the response was, because I told you to do it. No. No, 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 that doesn't work. We are going to do things that's meaningful. If we can't make it meaningful for the client, then we ought not ask them to do it. So that was a big challenge that a lot of my staff had to look at. You know, what is the function? What is the intended goal of this behavior? I'm not just giving it to you for busy work. And we need to help clients find solutions and overcome resistance. We've switched from this whole notion of resistance needs to be broken through to resistance is a clue that we've missed something. It's more rewarding to stay the same than it is to change. So what are the rewards? What are we missing? It's our job as impartial people, because we don't have the same blinders on that the clients may, to help them identify things that may be blocking them from being motivated to change. So when we talk about changing, we have to talk about behavior modification. Behaviors are observable, measurable events. If I do jumping jacks, I can count how many I do. If I throw a temper tantrum, I can count how many I do. I can count how long it lasts. It's observable and measurable in some way. Reinforcers increase the frequency of a behavior. So there are different kinds of reinforcers. For example, a positive reinforcer is giving me something. If you do X, then I will give you $50. I'm all about X. There are also negative reinforcers. If you come to group, and participate for the next eight weeks, then I will cut two weeks off of your treatment time. That's removing something that they don't like. Reinforcing is a quality that ensures the repetition of a behavior. If it's rewarding, you do it. If it's punishing, not so much. Punishment decreases a behavior. We punish children. We punish our pets. Sometimes we punish ourselves. When we punish something, it's supposed to reduce the frequency of a behavior. You notice I said supposed to. Sometimes, even though there's the punishment involved, there's rewards. Have you ever heard the phrase, negative attention is better than no attention? Well, there you go. Somebody may be getting in trouble, may be getting punished, but the rewarding quality of getting any attention supports that behavior coming back over and over again. Contingencies are like I talked about a few minutes ago. 
if you do x, then y will happen. Now, if you drive your car and text at the same time, you will run into a light pole. That's a contingency, a punishing one. If you do a good job, then you will get a promotion. That's a reward contingency. Everything has contingencies. That's just life. We can't operate, we can't do anything without having some sort of action-reaction. So think about how you can use contingencies in your sessions to get people to come, to get people to call if they're not going to be there, to get people to come on time, any of the problem behaviors you have, or any of the things that you want to help, help them achieve. That means there has to be a really good reward at the end. If I run 10 miles and I cross the finish line in the race, yay for me. Not a huge reward there unless I am really motivated by just finishing. It was an honor just to finish. No, I want to place. That's my reward. So you need to figure out what the rewards are. We do it for our kids all the time. Why don't we do it for ourselves? No, we're not too big for that. It's just human nature. So think about what the whys are that your clients are concerned about. If X, then Y. What are the rewards your clients are motivated by? So just kind of recap. We only do things in which the reinforcement outweighs the punishment. If I make a New Year's resolution to lose 20 pounds, that sounds great. I keep up with it for the first week. I'm in energized about it. But then I start realizing that I can't eat as much pizza and I have to exercise and all these other things that I may see as sort of punishing. And fitting into the next size smaller jeans just doesn't seem all that rewarding anymore. So the resolution goes, bye-bye. We need to make sure that the rewards always outweigh the punishment. Additionally, we need to ask why a person wants to change, but also why he or she doesn't want to change. I want to increase my motivation. Why are you not motivated now? What would help to motivate you? What things are keeping you from being excited about making this change? Think about, if you want to participate in the discussion online, anonymous, case examples of clients that you've had who've professed that they wanted to change but couldn't follow through. Think about the reasons why they may not have been ready or wanted to change or why the particular treatment that you had planned out for them may not have panned out for them. Yeah, you like that? Okay, more behavior modification. Competing behaviors. I love these. I love these. You can't do X and Y at the same time. One of my worst habits in the whole wide world is tasting everything that I cook. I taste it, I season it, I taste it some more. By the time I get to dinner, I'm not hungry anymore. If I chew gum or talk on the phone while I'm cooking, I don't do that as much because I can't politely talk on the phone and I certainly can't chew gum and sample dinner at the same time. Those are competing responses. Using the smoking analogy, it's unlikely, I guess it's possible, but it's unlikely somebody would walk on the treadmill and smoke at the same time. They don't even have to be walking hard, but they're probably not going to go into the gym, get on a treadmill, and light up a cigarette while they're walking on the treadmill. That's a competing response. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be exercising, just going into the gym, which is a non-smoking facility, maybe sitting in the spa. That's relaxing. You can do that even after a long day. It's better to reward competing responses than punish negative behaviors. So reward the client 
give them kudos, give them positive feedback for every time they do go to the gym after work, even if they don't work out. At least they made an effort. The other thing you can do is pair positive things with things you don't like so much. Going back to the treadmill. I love cycling. I don't know why. I've never been able to get into the treadmill. So when I would have treadmill time, I would watch TV. I'd watch shows that I normally wouldn't get at the house that we live in because we don't get cable out in the middle of nowhere. But so when I'd go to the gym, it was a reward because I had like expanded cable and everything. It was pre-Mac principle. I was pairing something that I did like, cable television, with something that I didn't like so much, walking on the treadmill. Try to pair some of these things up for your clients. Maybe they don't like going to meetings. What can they do? Maybe they can go with a friend. Think about things that are rewarding to them. Another activity. I like to give you time to think about this and apply this stuff. You can always email me after the presentation, message me once you're in the classroom, whatever. Um, but I do want you to take some of this, like I said, take it from knowledge to skills. So I want you to practice. Identify competing responses for binge eating, smoking, fighting, screaming, throwing a tantrum, whatever you want to call it, sleeping all day, every day. Real common in a lot of our clients who are depressed. I'm interested in some of the competing responses you can come up with. I, I don't by any means think that I am the complete knowledgeable person on all competing responses. I always look for creative alternatives. And still more, behavior strain. What is behavior strain? It means I've been doing this too long without a reward. Too much punishment or work without sufficient reward or too long between the initiation of the behavior and the reward. The perfect example of this is you take an elementary school child and you tell him, Tommy, if you behave every single day this week, then on Saturday we will go to some adventure park, whatever Tommy wants to do. Most young children can't wait an entire week. That's just too long without a reward. They need at least some little rewards every day when they get home. So when Tommy comes home from school, asking him how he did and giving him a big hug, being excited, giving him some sort of a token, anything to sort of keep that encouragement, keep that momentum going until Saturday. Yes, I realize you can't go to the adventure park every single day. But we need to make sure that there are at least small rewards and acknowledgments for effort throughout the week. As grown-ups, we're not that much different. The harder the behavior, the harder the change, the more frequently we're going to really benefit from at least some social rewards. If you find that you're giving up because you're just like, screw it, it's not worth the effort, that's behavior strain. You need to ramp up the intensity of the rewards and possibly the frequency. Using behavior modification. Well, person comes in and says, I want to be happier. I'll wave my magic wand and poof, you're happier. I had a therapist that I worked with, very, very talented man. And he, <laughs> bless his heart, former military, big, strong, tr silent person. And he had these little plastic magic fairy wands. And he would just poof knock people, not knock people, tap people on the head with a fairy wand. Why? Because he was showing them that just as quickly as this wand can go -ding, you can choose to change your attitude. You can choose to change your outlook. But it was just always something that made you smile. Even if you were having a really bad day, that and when he'd come out in his great big, um, he had these great big clown shoes that he would wear around just to see if people would notice. Anyhow, the objective, measurable. I want to feel at least a four out of five on the happiness scale, five or more days a week. That's easy to measure. 
I would probably challenge or encourage the person to make it a three out of a five, at least at the beginning, because you're not going to go from a one to a four overnight. This is, you know, a lofty goal, but it is measurable. Help them identify things, those exceptions, that they can do that help them feel happier. Play with their dog. Play with their children. Watch cartoons. Oh, cartoons are great. Um, maybe watch cartoons with their dog and their kid. I don't know. Figure out what works for, for them. And then help them make those things reasonable. When they're at work, they can't pop on a DVD of some cartoon. What can they do when they're having a bad day at work? Go outside on a walk for a little while? That's possible. When, where I used to work, we had a colony of feral cats that I helped a couple other people, the three of us tended. And when I would be stuck or having just kind of a bad moment, I would go out and check on the cat. Now they ran from me because they were feral and they didn't want to be loved and petted. But it made me happy. I would go out, I would see they were doing well, it would distract me for a minute and all was well. I'd go back in and go to work and it would all be done. Whatever it takes for your clients. Write down some of the most common reasons people come to see you as a therapist because they're having marital problems, because they're having problems at work, because they're angry all the time. Just spend five or ten minutes writing down the most common questions you get. Turn those, practice turning those into observable, measurable goals. How can you change to make that positive? Break that goal into three to five objectives that clearly state the W's. What's to be done? Who will do it? When? Why? Remember, it's got to be meaningful. We're not going to do it if we don't know, you know, what's the point? And where will it be done? And how, if applicable? Do it for yourself. Pretend you're the client. That way you know what your temperament and your, and your preferences are. But the, this gives you an example and practice making these positive goals. We've got the goals, now we need the motivation. There's a lot of things that I think I'd like to do, but nah, it's not worth the effort. So we need motivation. It's multidimensional. Emotionally, I want to do this because. I'm jazzed about it because. Intellectually, I need to do this because. And behaviorally, I am going to do this because. So let's look at those a little bit further. Emotionally, list 10 reasons you want to do whatever it is and review them daily. Keep your excitement level up. There's um, the old adage or whatever you want to call it if, for people who want to go on a diet for spring break. They hang their bikini up so they see it every day. Make a collage. Get a bunch of magazines, pictures, whatever. Make a collage that shows all the reasons that you want to do whatever it is. Maybe it's so you can feel happier. Maybe it's so you can have a big house. Maybe it's so you can be more of a family. <clears throat> and keep a journal of how things change positively for you as you move through your goal. Today was a little bit better because. Maintaining emotional motivations also means looking at the reasons you don't want to. So identify your most frequent cop-outs. Going to the gym, I was too tired. Nah, not a good excuse. Going to the gym, there was a lot of traffic. Okay, how can you get around that? We all have cop-outs when we feel less than motivated. So heading that off at the pass, figuring out why you cop out will help you prevent it. And tell three people about your goal. As soon as you make it public, it's harder to go back on it because they're going to say, hey, How's that exercise routine going? And you're not going to go, oh, well, I, you know, gave up on that. Or you're, at least you're not going to want to. List 10 reasons you need to do this. 
keep written information available that highlights the benefits of whatever you're doing. Exercise, reducing smoking, reading more, not drinking. <coughs> research, or have clients research, how this change can benefit your clients. Have them figure out all the cool reasons why they want to do whatever it is. Have them list 10 reasons they know they can. Kind of like the little engine that could. I know I can, I know I can, I know I can. And set an end date for each objective. Even the little engine knew where the top of the hill was. And then it was downhill from there. It was easy going. Set an end date so it doesn't feel like it's going to go on forever. And behaviorally, identify all the reasons that you will do this activity and all the obstacles, such as childcare issues, too far to travel, it's bad weather. Oh my gosh, we moved up to Virginia recently. And, you know, coming from Florida, they forecast a hurricane is coming and people go out and get supplies and then they start to have a party. I come up to Virginia and as soon as October 31st hits, Everything shuts down because there might be snow. Nobody even wants to make appointments to have meetings or anything until April because there might be bad weather in the future. I'm like, really? Um, it's just a different approach and a different culture. My point being, if there's bad weather, what are you going to do instead? How are you going to make it happen? Because you don't want to put your life on hold. I've got too much other stuff to do. Well, you've got to figure out how to make this a priority. Spouse is not supportive, not comfortable going to public meetings. There's a lot of reasons you may not want to do it. You've got to counter those in order to maintain your behavioral motivation. And also find reasons that you like doing it. Why do you like going to meetings? Because you get to socialize. Why do you like going to the gym? Because you get to socialize. No, that's me. Um, <laughs> socialize. I like to socialize. Those are my rewards. You need to figure out what works for your particular clients. Buddy up. Encourage people to get together with someone with a similar goal. Because if Sally's going to a meeting and expects Susie to go, and if they're carpooling or taking turns driving, it's less likely that either one of them is going to cop out. Okay, our last behavioral issue is time management. I don't have enough time in the day. Yes, you do. You just need to choose to. So identify all the things that you think you have to do. Then go back over that list and eliminate all those things that you don't have to do. I would like to do laundry today. Well, no, I wouldn't, but it needs to get done. But it doesn't need to get done today if I need to do something else that's more important. So eliminate some of those have-dos that are would-like-to-dos. Delegate anything that you can. My eight-year-old, for whatever reason, God bless her, really wants to learn how to do laundry and fold. Oh, she loves to fold laundry. So I'm all about delegating. <laughs> and then prioritize and combine. Try to do things together that can be combined. Um, maybe while stuff is in the dryer, you can be cleaning up the kitchen, or I don't know. There are a lot of things that can be combined, especially now that we have little Bluetooths. It's amazing how many call phone calls and stuff you can make and stuff you can get accomplished while you're driving to and from wherever, and you still have both hands on the wheel. Rewards maintain behavior, but they must be of sufficient frequency, intensity, and duration. We talked about that quite a bit already. Small daily rewards, great. Medium weekly rewards, needed. But when you accomplish that big old goal, there needs to be a celebration. Whatever that means for you. Learning styles. I've done a couple different presentations on learning styles, so I'm not going to belabor it here. But I do want to highlight, just for those of you who haven't seen it, we all learn differently. Global learners 
really like to have an overview. They're like me. I'm a global learner. I have to know what the movie's about. I have to have seen the trailer before I go in to see the movie. Drives me crazy not to have an idea. When I read a book, I read the back cover first to figure out what the book's about. And then I dive into it. That helps me organize my thoughts. Sequential learners don't need that as much. So when you teach to a group, especially, you're going to have global and sequential learners. So start with an overview. Start with a big, these are the objectives for this class. And then have an outline or a PowerPoint that you follow. Sequential learners, just as it says, like to go step by step. And if you start jumping around all willy-nilly, you're going to freak them out. Now, that's how you kind of conceptualize information. Auditory, visual, and kinesthetics, how you take it in. And we're all a combination of these. But a lot of times, one or, one or two areas is stronger. For me, believe it or not, I do much better if I read it and I apply it. I don't do well in lectures. I get bored and I quit listening. Um, <laughs> if you're watching this, you may be an auditory learner. So when you're teaching to groups, make sure that you have that outline, that you have something written for them. When, when I do groups in recovery situations, I make ample use of a whiteboard. We write things down. So say it. Write it, if you can, give them something to read, and then have them apply it. Have activities where they practice doing whatever it is in group and on their own. So everything you teach, you need to say it, write it, and apply it. Finally, temperament. Extroverts don't mind being interrupted. Introverts can't stand it which I'm kind of halfway in between, because I really hate interruptions. Um, so make sure to bear that in mind. If you have a situation where you're constantly being interrupted while you're trying to teach, or while you're trying to do a session, that's really going to bug some people. Sensing versus intuitive. Make sure you give the big picture, global, as well as the details, sequential. And present people information in a way that is meaningful to people who are thinkers versus feelers, if you will. And if you go to Kiersey.com, you can learn more about temperament styles, a whole lot more than we even have time for here. But thinkers think about things in terms of right and wrong and justice and fairness, and they talk about reactions. A lot of times, um, people who choose things like law enforcement or military, they tend to be more thinkers. Feelers, we tend to react emotionally. And you can tell by the words that we use. I talk about being upset or being angry or being sad versus talking about um, feeling stuck or like I was kicked in the gut. Use descriptive words that make stuff meaningful to both types of people. And finally, Find a balance between being overly structured and not structured at all. Because a lot of people get bored if it's too structured. But then some of us control freaks really don't like when things get out of control. So have a plan. Stay with the plan. And if you need to make a little detour, bring it right back onto the path that you were supposed to be on instead of going off into Never Never Land. So we've talked about goal setting. You have your big goals, observable and measurable, and you're adding a behavior. Whatever you're taking away, you've got to put something in its place. Objectives are your smaller sub-goals that can be accomplished in eh, a week to a month, sometimes three months, but a week to a month. And then you have your knowledge and skills that you need to acquire in order to achieve your objectives. We talked about the fact that you need reinforcement 
We all need reinforcement for our behaviors. We talked about how you need to present information, you need to say it, write it, and apply it. We talked about emo three different types of motivation, emotional, intellectual, and behavioral. And finally, environmental motivators. People are going to be a whole lot more likely to stay motivated and do what you want them to do if they're comfortable. Pay attention to what your office looks like, what the environment's like, what it smells like, whether it's the too hot or too cold. People will be a lot happier and a lot more receptive if they're comfortable. All right, we're going to go to the question and answer part of this uh, presentation. So I'll see you in just a minute. Okay, so, my handy dandy little iPad. One of the questions we got are, what are some examples of motivation techniques you've incorporated into treatment plans? Well, where I used to work, a lot of the consumers that came into our clinic were not there by choice. So one of the biggest motivators was getting rid of me. So we'd set these goals, and I'd say, if you've accomplished all of these things by X date, then you will be done with me. Um, if you haven't, then we may need to extend your treatment. That's if X, then Y. Um, other motivators that we used to have when people would graduate successfully, we would always have parties for them. Um, you know, the cafeteria would bring in food. It was really nice. It was a way to say congratulations and a way to encourage them and the people who still hadn't achieved their goals. Again, most of those consumers really liked getting positive attention from their peers. So it was a win-win for everybody. Um, other motivators as far as um, uh, counseling goes. I help people identify motivators that are sort of inherent in doing what they want to do. People who are depressed, what's the motivator for getting out of bed in the morning? Well, you may find if you get out of bed, you will feel less achy and less tired. I didn't realize um, until I did it that staying in bed for days on end could make you more exhausted. I have just a lot of empathy for people who are on bed rest. So asking them what the difference is. We have one activity that we use in brief therapy. It's called the quarter technique. They get up in the morning and they flip a coin or a quarter. Quarters are easier to catch than dimes. But anyway, if it lands on heads, then they have to act as if they've already achieved their goal. They're not depressed anymore. They're in recovery. They're happier, whatever it is. If it lands on tails, then they continue to act like they normally would, just be their normal selves. And they keep a log of this. Some people like to keep a journal. I use the word log because it doesn't necessarily mean prose. <laughs> but what we would find is when people would go back and look at their heads days, things would be brighter. Things would seem to be better because they felt like they were accomplishing something. Those, those are the biggest or most common motivators that I would use. Um, in that particular setting. Now you also have settings such as um, personal trainers. They may have other motivators that they can use for people um, or other punishments as the case may be. Uh, the other, I guess, punishment, if you will, or we call it negative reinforcement. Um, in the residential facility, people would lose privileges for misbehavior. So if they wanted to keep their privileges, they needed to follow the rules. Privileges included things like watching TV, phone calls, outings to get away from the facility, etc. We tried not to overuse those because we were, after all, dealing with adults. 
however, it did strike a chord when they had extra time to reflect on what was going on because they didn't have the TV going all the time. What are the biggest objections clients have to motivational strategies? I don't know that I would qualify, as an, qualify it as an objection, but some consumers are not action-oriented when they come to therapy. So if they are wanting to take the Rogerian style of talking and talking it out and gradually getting through roadblocks, you can incorporate some motivation, but it moves more slowly. And there's less looking at you do this behavior for this reason. It's more talking about how you feel and how the day went and looking at patterns. Um, it depends on what people's personality is and sometimes what the issue is. You're not going to use motivational strategies to help someone deal with a history of sexual abuse. I mean, you can use some motivation to keep them coming to treatment, but you're not going to use the same types of interventions that you would use, say, for substance abuse. How would you tell a client to go about setting goals, realistic or small changes? Telling them is not as easy as doing it with them the first few times because it's hard to explain what's realistic or what, in my opinion, is realistic and what's observable and measurable. So we talk it out. And as we're setting goals and we're creating the treatment plan, I'm talking and everything I'm thinking pretty much is coming out of my mouth. So they understand my thought process. And then I ask them for their input and their opinion about what's going to work for them and what they think is realistic to accomplish in the next seven days. When you start putting distinct parameters on it, people can get a whole lot more accurate than if you say, oh, what do you think you can accomplish in the next three months? Oh, some people think they can accomplish the world. Um, some people think they can barely get through phase one. So it's a matter of giving them smaller, more distinct things. Um, I guess another way to think of it, my, my spatial orientation or whatever you want to say is not good. I can take a big old pot of food and not be able to tell what size container I need to put it in to get it in the fridge. The smaller the pot of food, the easier it is for me to say, OK, I can take this much from this round pot and put it in this size square dish. And yeah, you know, that's basic math, but it's not my thing. Um, I have a hard time fitting square dishes into rectangular ones. But once you have a smaller amount of information or amount of time to deal with, then you have less room for error. Okay, it looks like we've come to the end of our questions. If you're wanting CEUs for this presentation, then you will need to go to allceus.com, click on um, sign up, and you'll go to the a la carte page and select live courses. This course will be available to get CEUs until noon tomorrow. After that point, it's obviously not live anymore, so we will be converting it to an on-demand class. Thank you, and I hope to see you again.